Good morning. Ken is lost his voice and down with sickness, so be praying for him. If you turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, it's my privilege then to bring the word to us this morning with very little preparation. So just setting the bar low, just keeping it. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning as the body of Christ for these precious moments that echo forward to eternity, to a time when we will be together around your throne, worshiping for all eternity with no remnant of sin, with all our hopes realized in the face of Christ. God, thank you for your word, for your spirit, the way that you minister to us and guide us into the truth of your word so that we would be built up in Christ, conformed to his image. And we we pray that you would do that this morning. God, we pray for our sister Samia, that you would be with her, heal her, give her strength as she recovers from her surgery. And God, we pray for Ken, that you would restore his health to him as well, his voice, his strength. And God, as we come this morning, we pray then for your spirit to move in our hearts. Teach us the truth of this passage and the beauty of of a love relationship with Jesus Christ that is transformative in every sense of the word. God, we pray that you would do that for your glory and for our great joy as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopefully from last week's sermon, Ken being in Romans 13, 8 through 10, Hopefully, there's been some discussion and maybe even some wrestling around Old Covenant law, this new ethic of New Covenant love, the fulfillment of the law in Christ and in love in us, and with the purpose of the law, which was never given for our sanctification. And so this morning, I want to look at John 14 in the broader context of the upper room discourse John 13 through even up until 17, that final night of Christ's life. And I want to continue to wrestle with this idea of the law of Christ and wrestle with Christian obedience, sanctification, and how it happens and what informs it. And so I want to begin by asking two questions. The first is this, what is the content of my obedience as a Christian? Where is the Christian life that I am now to live defined for me? And then secondly, here in a minute, I want to ask, what is the motivation and the power to obey that content? And so in some sense, there'll be some overlap from last week. We'll look at the whole context of the scriptures, specifically in the upper room discourse, but tie it in in lots of places. That overlap is good. We want to affirm that this is what the scriptures say. But regarding that first question, what is the content of my obedience as a Christian? You've got two options. Is it old covenant law or is it Christ himself? I'll give you three options or some blending of the two. Is the content of my obedience as a Christian Christ, his words, the instructions and examples of Jesus, and the New Testament authors then interpreting the Christ event for us in the context of this new covenant ethic of love. It is such an important question for us to answer. Otherwise, you're going to go to the wrong place to try to, to, try to get something that it was never meant to give. And we won't go there, but spend some time in 2 Corinthians 3. And listen to the ministry of the Old Covenant law. It is a ministry of condemnation. It will crush you by design. 
It will shut you up as a sinner by design. It is a ministry, Paul says, of death. The other content, the other way of living is abiding in Christ. And this trajectory, this content will set you free to love Christ and to love other people and it will give wings to your Christian life. It will give joy to your soul and hope and real Christian growth from the heart. Love for Christ empowers the Christian life, not the Mosaic law. This is what we as an elder board are shepherding this church toward with all of our strength. This is what we want for you. This has been our experience. We're convicted by the text. And I know this has been your experience too. The joy of resting in Christ for obedience for salvation, for sanctification. And so this morning, I want to explore the law of Christ as its foundations are laid in John 13 through 17, this upper room discourse, and specifically John 14, 15. In the Old Covenant, the content of obedience was clearly Mosaic law. It defined the people, it defined their approach to God and their ability to live in the land. Do this and live. So you have 600 plus Clear commands to obey with sacrifices and offerings to bring. To maintain, hear this, a non-saving relationship with God in the promised land. Now that doesn't mean you couldn't be saved in the old covenant time, but no one was ever saved by the old covenant. Deuteronomy 5.33, you shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you. That's old covenant law that you may live and that it may, be, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. In the new covenant, the content of obedience is Christ himself. Things have changed. It's Christ, it's his commandments, his example, his instructions, his heart, and the New Testament writings as they expound upon Christ. Remember Jesus saying, a new commandment I give to you. He speaks in John 14 multiple times, my commandments. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say unto you. There is an inescapable priority on Christ for the Christian. The second question then, what is the motivation and the power to obey that content? In the Old Covenant, there were commands to obey, but God's own testimony regarding the people was that there wasn't a heart that could do this. The Old Covenant ethic was love for God and love for people. It's a manifestation of the character of God. The instructions were there, but the ability was not. There wasn't a heart capable, empowered, free, designed to love and honor God. So it was an old covenant hope, but never a reality under the old covenant. Turn to Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. I want to read a fairly lengthy passage, but it is this exact reality. Hope, but no heart. The context of Deuteronomy 5 is Moses recounting the giving of the Ten Commandments before the people enter the land after the wilderness wanderings. And this is what he says in verse 22. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire, of the cloud and of the thick gloom with a great voice. And he added no more. He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. You said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. They were surprised at that. They expected to fall down dead at the voice of God. Now then, why should we die? 
For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? And so they say to Moses, go near and hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will hear and do it. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may, may be well with them and with their sons forever. There's a sadness to this statement. An inability. Things aren't right under the old covenant. They're not final. By design, this is God's plan. And that reality would only be remedied in the coming of Christ. But until Christ, God would prophesy of this coming remedy for this problem, this heart problem. And so skip over to Ezekiel 36. I know Ken read Jeremiah 31. I don't know if you... We, we, we did Ezekiel 36, but turn there, and I'll quote from Jeremiah 31, and we'll read Ezekiel 36, prophesying of what God would do in the coming of Christ to remedy the problem of words but no heart, desire but no ability, hope but no power. The promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 33 says this, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then the prophecies of Ezekiel 36, 24. He says, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances." These are prophetic promises of newness, of completion, of new covenant realities. The reconciling of God and man, and now for the first time, the true ability by the Spirit to obey from the heart. There's six of them I want to highlight. First of all, there's a new covenant coming, not like the old covenant. It's distinct. It's different. And in that new covenant comes a new relationship through the atoning work of Christ, the, the forgiveness of sins. And then he makes this incredible statement, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. A new relationship brings a new law location. Instead of tablets of stone, right here on the inside of our being, written on our hearts, written on our souls, a new law location. Next, there's a new heart to write that law upon. It's not just written on the inside, it's written on a whole new tablet of heart. There's a new heart, the old one's taken out. The promise of a new presence within that heart. The Spirit of God Himself would come to dwell inside His people. God would live in us, He would dwell in this, us, the temple. And that would produce a new obedience. God would cause his people to obey and obey carefully from that new heart, empowered by that indwelling spirit of God, and there would be precise obedience. And so the stage is set in the Old Testament for some, something radically new to happen. A saving relationship with the God of the universe where everything works as it should. There's no more, oh, I, I wish they had a heart to do that. There will be a heart to do that. There is a heart to do that through faith in Christ. Everything would work as it should forever. 
And this newness would come in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the e- on the eve of the inauguration of the new covenant in the upper room, the night before Jesus would die on the cross and through his blood accomplish this new- newness, we should or could expect Jesus to address these realities to his disciples. To say something about this coming newness, and he does. The upper room discourse with the 12 disciples on that important night. He speaks of the reality of this coming law of Christ. And so turn back to John 14. And I want to explore the context around John 14. And and I got stuck in John 13 trying to establish the context. It's too good. The washing of the disciples' feet is the foundational moment of the law of Christ being portrayed for them in an inescapable way. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I, I, I believe that to be a clear definition of the law of Christ. As Jesus lays the foundation the night before, he would accomplish the newness, accomplish redemption. So entering in, here's how I would define the law of Christ from the text. I mean the whole Bible. Spirit-empowered love for Christ that empowers Christ-like love. That is the law of Christ at work in us. Spirit-empowered love for Christ that empowers Christ-like love. That is the newness that we now live in. Romans 13, 10, love does does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In in theological circles, love and law sometimes are put against each other, like like two sides of a stadium. One side of the crowd cheering, law, law, law. The other side cheering, love, love, love. We've got to land on one side or the other for how we're going to live the Christian life because they certainly aren't enemies. But here's the point. Here's the key, I think, to walking into these questions. You and I have to know where we are in redemptive history and where we are personally in redemptive history to live a faithful Christian life. Law and love, law and grace, they're it's essential topics for sanctification. We have to understand these things. I'll give you two examples. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. It's a clear declaration of what side of the stadium we should be on. And then I, I think this is a great verse of tension with a, with a, that demands we answer the question. 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Don't turn there, just listen. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Wait a second. I thought circumcision was a command of God. It was. But now you and I are conspicuously not under that covenant anymore. And so Paul can say, it's nothing. We have to know our time. We have to know where we sit in redemptive history. Covenant law is a lot like what country you live in. If you live in a a foreign country, you are under the laws of that land. If you move to the States, those laws still have their purpose for that country, but not here. You're under a different jurisdiction in the United States. These are the governing laws. Something definitively has changed as you've moved from one jurisdiction to another. And so the key question for every Christian is what country are you living in? What side of the stadium are you cheering from? What law has jurisdiction over you? Are you under the old covenant external law code, trying to be perfected by it? Or are you motivated and led by the law of Christ? This law of love on the inside, driving out with affection for Christ and love for him and love for people. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. These simple words come in the upper room discourse discourse the night before Jesus dies. And so, how do we hear these words? Are they a command, a threat, 
An encouragement? Is it an assumed reality? Is it just a hopeful statement? Is love the chief and only motivation for obedience? Is it one of many options? And so our journey this morning will be to try to understand what Jesus is saying in the near context, but filling in blanks from the law of Christ seen elsewhere, from Romans 13.8, in that context. In the upper room, Jesus spoke extensively about love. Thirteen times that night, he expounded on, explained love. He spoke of God's love for the disciples, Jesus' love for his disciples, their love for each other, what defines love, the love that motivates obedience. And I would encourage you to read the upper, John 13 through 17, and get a feel for the, the priority of Christ and the priority of love on this key night. It's the final hour tutorial on new covenant love. And it is instructive what Jesus leaves his disciples with, both in what he says, and I think it's very instructive, and what he doesn't say on the night before he dies. These final words of Jesus begin in the upper room in John 13, 1. So flip the page back to John 13. This final evening of Jesus' life would be a shocking revelation of who Jesus is and his humble and meek love for others as both the example and the motivation for us to go live the Christian life. These were the men that would found the New Testament church. And this is why I believe this night is so important. Last things are important things. There are moments for the essential things to rise to the top. Dropping off a child at college saying goodbye to a son going off to the military, these moments have a way of drawing out what really needs to be said. We get right to it. And this is what the text says beginning in John 13, 1. This is, this is what John, remembering that night, what he says. To summarize it, he says, he loved us. As Jesus prepares us for his death, he loves us. John 13, 1, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's John's introduction, because he was there. His introduction to these final hours was, he loved us, having loved us. He loved us to the very end, to the utmost, whether it's by degree or by duration. Jesus loved us that night. And specifically, he loved us by washing our feet. He washed their feet. That was the entry point to his demonstration of love for what was yet to come. Now, I could think of, of a lot of things that Jesus could have done in that moment. I'm leaving. We're going to found the New Testament church. Let's get out a dry erase board, dry erase board. And let's plot out some administrative details. Peter, you're in charge of discipleship and evangelism. James, you're going to teach. John, you're going to be, you're going to be shepherding. None of that. But he's absolutely planning and preparing them for their journey. He's planning by fixing their eyes on who he is and his love for them. What is his heart? How does he lead? What are his instructions, his new commandments? What are his words? Uh, the essence of the law of Christ played out in so many ways on that final night, right before their eyes. Jesus is laying this final foundation before he departs and dies on the cross. And he does it by washing their feet. It's almost unthinkable that he would wash their feet. This majestic and sovereign over all the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, down on the floor, washing their dirty feet. That event was so, so powerful, so surprising, it's almost offensive. And yet it is the essence of the law of Christ. Because the law of Christ is not an external standard, it is Christ himself. The law of Christ is Christ. 
It's Christ loving. It's who he is and how he thinks and acts and loves and leads. It's his perfect love demonstrated for us, then reflected in us. This moment was exemplary, but it was also prescriptive. He's telling them what to do and how to do it and why to do it. But the full understanding of of his instruction was still future. Look in verse 5 of John 13. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now but you will understand hereafter. Jesus is clearly speaking to a time after the cross, after the Spirit of God would come and transform these disciples' hearts. When when with this new covenant heart, these disciples would see through new eyes and, and their heart would beat with love and understanding and they would get it really, truly perceive what Jesus was doing. Look in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who was sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. This, This is so drastic in distinction from old covenant law. Jesus could have said, Look, I'm dying tomorrow. When I'm done, wash feet. It's a commandment. Wash feet. This would be true and right and holy. Serve each other. There's the instruction. But nothing could be further from this transition from law to grace, from old covenant to new covenant, than the very person of Christ sitting there doing this. So notice the ought to in the text, of Jesus' instructions. It comes after his lowly demonstration of love and humility. He makes himself the issue. I'm going to love you, and the way I love you is going to be the way that you're going to love others. From the greatest heights of the glory of heaven to your feet. I'm the Lord. I'm the teacher. Watch what I'm doing. And then follow my example of love with your love for each other. I washed your feet. Why did he wash their feet? He washed their feet because he loved them. It's this intimate, relational, divine love. And it's pure and it's simple and it's right there on the floor at their feet. But it's a person. It's not a law. You also ought to wash one another's feet. This is the new covenant motivation in a nutshell Because Jesus has loved you, love him by loving others. And he finishes the the instruction with this invitation to a blessing. You're blessed if you do this. It's so gentle. It's so inviting. Just reading it makes me want to wash feet. Not because of some harsh law with fear of condemnation, but because of its Christ. And Christ in us resonates with Christ loving, serving. Both the content and the motivation of the new covenant is on the table here and really nothing else. But just this reciprocated experiential love. John 13, 15, For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. So the last thing that we should do is turn foot washing into a law. Don't value the you should do this in the text over the one who is doing it. Washing feet is inseparable from the feet washer. We can't isolate his commands from his heart, his grace from his person. He's laying the foundation of Christ-centered love 
as the very expression of our faith. Because this would be who the disciples would become, and us too. Here's why the full impact was yet to come. The love of Christ was displayed for them in greater ways than foot washing. The next morning, he'd die for them. The next afternoon, he would die for them. He would take the punishment of hell for them in the, on the following day at the cross. They were there with Jesus that night. He was at their feet. They were utterly shocked and stunned by him doing that. How much more the next day? As they were confused and yet in awe, this is God? This is our Christ? And you can feel that they're fighting it. They're fighting it. They're fighting the love of Christ for them. The humility of Christ towards them. When in reality, they were watching the fullness of the the old covenant law being fulfilled right in front of them. The Exodus 6 prescription was being fulfilled right there in a living and breathing person. Someone who loved God with all his heart and soul and mind and strength and loved his neighbor as himself, and they were receiving that love. They were the neighbor that he was loving as as himself right then and there on the floor. The disciples would later give up everything for this Christ. All of them would suffer greatly for Christ. All but one would be martyred and killed for their faith. Why? Because they'd been loved by Christ. And their love was so strong. It was strong unto death in response to the love of Christ. Their spirit-empowered response to him was to love him in return with their very lives. All of it to the end. By the time we get to John 14, 15, we're at a high point in the upper room discourse. Jesus says, In the few verses before, believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe in me and you'll do the works that I do. Greater works than these. And so you have this kind of, on the top of that hill, he talks about answered prayer in 13 and 14. Pray and I'll hear and I'll respond. He talks about obedience fueled by love in verse 15. And then he talks about the coming of the Spirit to enable all of this. In verses 16, I think all the way up to 21. And so I want to focus the remainder of our time just on the words in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'm going to give us just two points. The first is this. The content of the commandments is important. And we'll start at the end of the verse. In John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus is the new lawgiver. Seven times in the upper room, that final night context, John references Jesus' claim on his commandments, my commandments, my word to you. Why? Because Jesus himself and all that he told them was to be their new law. Their guiding authority. This was their marching orders. Him, the law of Christ. This is what the Spirit would lead them to. My commandments. My commandments is a different covenant code than the Mosaic law. Jesus doesn't point them to Moses. He doesn't reference old covenant law that night as the content of their obedience. He is the new priest. And as Ken pointed out last week, in Hebrews 7, It says the the law was given on the basis of the priesthood. Change the priesthood, change the law. Jesus is the new high priest. And with him comes a new covenant code. He's instituting the new covenant law of Christ for his disciples. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. That is the summary statement of the law of Christ. It's informed by the person of Christ. His commandments are now our covenant code. He empowers love, which the law pointed to in the first place. So I want to say a few things then about what the law of Christ does not say about the old covenant law. And I think this is helpful because because in, in journeying these things over the years and as we've been studying as an old word and thinking and talking, there's, there's questions that come up. And so I want to give us a couple of reasons what the law of Christ is not saying about the old covenant law. 
So it's really like, what do I do with the old covenant if I have a new covenant code? The first thing it's not saying is it's not saying the old covenant law is not true. It's God-breathed. It's infallible and errant. First half of your Bible, it reveals the character of God. But its applicability to your life is not tied to its truthfulness. But it's timing. Secondly, the, old, the, the law of Christ is not saying about the old covenant law that it's useless. Rip out the first half of your Bible. It is useful, but not for the purpose of conforming us to the image of Christ. Because of timing. Because of what country we now live in. What side of the stadium we're cheering from. Thirdly, the law of Christ is not saying that the old covenant law has no role in redemptive history now. It's still revealing the plan and the purposes of God. And there's ways that we need to learn to read the old covenant without bringing ourselves under it. The, the, the old covenant, the, old, the entire Old Testament is magnificent as it pictures and portrays God's promises, God's character, and, and, and speaks to Christ in every way. Fourthly then, and finally, it's, it, the, the new covenant law is not saying about the old covenant law that it ceases to point and to prophesy of Christ. It is still all about the coming Messiah the coming gospel and the culmination of all things in Christ. But what Jesus himself is saying, along with the New Testament authors, is that it is definitively not the code of law that we are under. We do not live according to old covenant law while under the new covenant. So secondly, John 14, 15, I want us to see the power of the condition met. The power of the condition met is very important. I said two points. I've got three. We're still on time. Jesus is linking these two ideas together in John 14, 15. So we've got to pay really close attention to what he's saying. He's linking love and obedience. It's an if-then statement. It's a conditional statement. If the condition is met, love for Christ, then the result will occur. Obedience will follow. The fruit of the Spirit will come. Righteousness, godliness. You will be transformed if you love Christ. He's both defining his disciples. The followers of Christ are lovers of Christ. And he's focusing their attention on the motivation for obedience, which is simply in this text, it's love. You could almost sum up the gospel with this. Do you love the Lord Jesus? Do you love him? Do you love everything about him? What he's done for you? His death, his resurrection, his life, his words, his person. Do you love him? I live so much of my professing Christian life not loving Christ. And in the middle of being like a church-going young man that knew a lot about the Bible, someone wonderfully took me aside and says, And said, it just doesn't sound like you know him. I said, thank you. And I went back to my dorm room and I was wrecked. Completely wrecked because he was right. I knew everything about this Christ that I could get my hands on, but I didn't love Christ. And then there he was. that's, That's when he changed my heart. And this love for Christ began this journey that his words are only for the purpose of revealing him so that I could love him more. The silence in John 14, 15 14, 15 is instructive as well. Notice what Jesus does not say. Now, I know it's it's an argument from silence, and you can make another argument from, from silence that he's assuming the entire Old Covenant law as he says this. I don't think that's what he's doing. But I do want you to hear some things that he's not saying. He doesn't say in John 14, 15, If you love the old covenant law, he doesn't say, if you fear me, if you fear hell, if you have right doctrine, if you try really hard, if you're smart, disciplined, none of that. He simply says, if you love me, if your heart is for me, if your affection is for me, if your heart is set on honoring me and serving me and knowing me, 
all that love would entail towards Christ. If you have affection for me, you'll obey me. You'll walk with me. This is the very fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, 26. He said he would give a new heart and put his spirit in us and cause us to walk in his statutes and be very careful to obey him. How in the world is he going to do that? What would guarantee that? The heart is so wicked and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Know that he's talking about the old heart in Jeremiah 17. He gives a new heart. He gives a new heart that loves Christ, that's built for that very purpose. And listen, it is unstoppable in its design. Not because of our great intestinal fortitude, because God does what he does and he gets what he gets. And when he puts a new heart in you, buckle up, you're going to love Christ. It isn't unique to us. This is the motivation of Christ himself. Jesus was motivated in precisely the same way. Look in John 14, 30. He says, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Jesus didn't need a new heart. His was perfect. It had perfect love for his Father, and it was expressed always and only in perfect, careful obedience to him. So with all that beauty and all that power and all that transforming new covenant heart, why in the world do you and I tend towards law and not love? I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Here's a few reasons. Because there's, sometimes there's a fear that if we just love him, we'll lose holiness. We fear missing something, that, that love is, it will permit some kind of lawlessness to creep through because there needs to be a law to hedge it in. We, be, we believe that love is an insufficient guardian against sin. Perhaps, maybe, because we see how feeble our love really can be in this life for God and for everyone else. Wait, if you're just leaving this to my love, we're going to get nowhere. I'm going back to Moses. Boom. Let's say I want to get up in the morning on time. I'm not saying me. This is for a younger person. But I'm a, I'm a snoozer. But I'm not a snoozer. When you get older, you can't sleep. Just wake up. But let's say you want to get up in the morning on time, but you're a snoozer. You can't get it done. And you don't want to address the heart issue of why you snooze. So what you'll do is you'll build what you think is a more powerful, motivating system to wake your sorry self up in the morning. And it looks like this, more alarms. How many people have multiple alarms in their room? Sorry. More alarms, louder alarms, alarms on the other side of the room, alarms that cause bright lights to shine bright in my room, alarms that shake my bed, that spray water in my face, that play recordings of motivational speakers. Good morning, wake up! <laughs> You'll beg other people to please wake me up in the morning. Please, help me. Take my blankets and throw them out the window. We'll try anything except to deal with the issue of the heart. And what is the issue? You just love sleep, and you love yourself, and you can't get out of bed to save your life. So here's the greater reality. There is a greater affection than sleep, even in the secular realm. Absolutely, there's a greater affection. Have you ever struggled to get out of bed for something you loved more than sleep? A vacation, a first date, a new job, your wedding day. That alarm goes off, and it's like your brain was already at the starting line, and the alarm was the starting pistol, and you fly out of bed like, I've been waiting for this moment, let's go. Why? Because you love what the day will bring. I doubt Sam and Haley this morning, they're getting married this afternoon. Snooze, snooze, snooze. More rules, more external constraints and motivators can't get the job done. 
They might move you maybe for a moment if you fear something, some kind of punishment, some kind of ridicule, but you will do what you want to do in the end. You will do what you love. And so the battle becomes for us, not more love, not more laws, but more love, not more laws, more love sifting through my affections and by the power of the Spirit putting to death sin and disobedience. It requires deep inside thinking about what moves me to do what I do. We fear what we think a life of love for Christ will permit. We fear it to be a weak life. It's anything but that. We love fences. We love checklists. We think that they're easier than loving Christ and trusting his word. We love fences instead of spiritual heart surgery, simple checklists, obedience, rather than confronting my remaining sin by faith and the very person of Christ who laid down his life for me. Fences feel safe, but they aren't real. We, by nature, before Christ, are fence climbers. We go out and we explore beyond the fence. We look over the fence. Whatever's clearly marked as danger, we want to see why. We want to go out a little bit further than the fence says. Do you remember the garden? If you have to be restrained externally from what your heart really wants, the issue is not how high the fences are or need to be but the sad reality of what your heart really wants. The gospel alone changes the heart. It both restrains the heart by love and moves it forward by love. And when, when God forgives us and puts his spirit in us, the fences come down and we're actually for the first time finally free. But free without fences. Free with a heart inside that loves Christ. The law, therefore, is powerful and God-ordained, but only for its purpose which was never to change or empower our hearts. The law's purpose was to define our hearts as utterly sinful, which it does very well. Law is completely powerless to do what it was never designed to do. And so letting go of law to fully embrace Christ is not only the new covenant paradigm command, it is the only path to true holiness. And here's the deal. If you put your affections if you love Christ, if you seek him, he will in no way leave you open to more sin. We've, if we fix our eyes and our affections on Christ, we are beholding infinite holiness and the grace to obey and be conformed to that holiness. There is no hope in law. That's why God gave us Christ. So don't miss the gift of himself and go back to what pointed to him coming. There is an offense to God when we, when we go back and we live under the law of Moses and we think that there's power there when the law spoke of Christ in every way. Finally and thirdly, the person of greatest affection is important. He says, if you love me, the last thing we're supposed to come away with from a text like this is some kind of burden to go and try to motivate ourselves to love Christ for the purpose of obedience. That I need to somehow stir this up on my own. I need to, to, to get this wheel turning inside so I'll love him more. All of this is from God. We can't save ourselves. We can't grow ourselves. But here's the hope. When we simply look to Christ by faith as that treasure in the field, the one we desperately need to be saved who alone is everything to us. He is altogether lovely for our salvation and for our sanctification. When we look to Christ for obedience, he is no less lovely than when, we, when he first saved us. Meaning this, God has made it easy to love Christ because there is no one more lovely than him. Think just for a minute about the Lord Jesus Christ no one has done more, said more, suffered more, sacrificed more, is more perfect, is more kind, is more gracious, is more affectionate and compassionate and approachable and good through and through than our Christ. 
There's simply no person, no thing more beautiful than Christ. And so we sing about him, we speak with him, we read about him, we talk about him, we study him, we abide in him, and we love him. And our affection grows. And our love grows for this lovely Christ. And we're changed. Law never changed us. We don't stare into the face of the law and soar to new heights of love and obedience to Christ. The Spirit is not leading us to Moses. The Spirit is leading always these new covenant hearts of love to the lovely one in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and God's mystery. And so the application for this morning is love him and you will grow in him. Behold him and he will change you. Abide with him and in him and your time with Jesus will provoke your heart to a greater and greater love for your Savior and you will be changed, guaranteed, according to the promise of God's new covenant. 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Let's pray. God, we thank you for opening our eyes to behold the beauty of Jesus Christ by faith. God, thank you for the transforming work of your spirit, the simplicity of dropping the fences and changing the heart and giving your people affection for Christ. God, our confession is that we love him dearly. We want to love him more. And we long for that day when we will see him face to face and we will love him perfectly. God, give us strength until that day. Give us a greater affection for Christ until that day. Thank you for John 14, 15. Would you work this out in our heart for our joy in Christ and for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen.